All right, Algebra 2, if you haven't figured it out, things are getting pretty deep in here. Uh, real algebraic stuff here, not a whole lot of number stuff. Um, so today we're in 5.5, five, we're going to get into it some more. Theorems about roots of polynomial equations. Why is the rational root theorem important? Okay. Well, what is the rational root theorem? What it says is this. If p of x is a function, okay, finding the roots of p of x equal to zero, roots, just like we've been doing, we've been factoring and quadratic formulas and all that, uh, trying to find those x values uh, when y is zero. Uh, here's another method to look at it, okay, when you can't factor it and do all, you know, we get these big polynomials. First thing you're going to look for is the integer roots, and they have to be factors of a of zero, factors of here, just like we did with quadratics, okay, we took factors of that c term that added up or subtracted to give us our b term. So we know that uh, energy roots have to be uh, factors of that constant term, a0. The rational roots must have a reduced form of p over q, where p are the factors of the, inter, uh, the constant term here, and q are factors of your leading coefficient, a n. Okay? And here's where things get a little, they can get a little dirty in here. Okay? Take this example right here. 21x squared plus 29x plus 10 equals 0. Okay? Your an, your leading coefficient, what will end up being your q is 21. Your constant term is 10, which ends up being your p. So q are factors of 21. 1 times 21, 3 times 7. You got plus or minus because you can take a negative times a negative. Factors of 10, 1 and 10, 2 and 5, plus or minus. Okay? So p over q is going to be each of these p's, 1, 2, 5, and 10, plus or minus, all over 1, then all over plus or minus 3, then all over plus or minus 7, then all over plus or minus 21. And you say, oh my god, that could be a lot of factors to have to kind of check. You're right, it is. Okay? We won't do a whole lot of that, where you're going to have to do a lot of that, but yeah, it can be a lot. Let me show you what we got here. Okay? So what you do then is you start plugging each of those p of q's into your function for x until you get 1 to equal 0. Okay? Remember that remainder theorem. We said whatever you plug in for x, if you get 0 for your y, then that x is a root. Okay? So if you get 2x cubed minus x squared plus 2x plus 5, and you've got to find the rational roots, well, uh, my p is factors of 5, so it's plus or minus 1 and 5. Q is plus or minus 1 and 2, factors of my leading coefficient. So if I put 1 or 5 over 1, I get plus or minus 1, plus or minus 5. If I put plus or minus 1 and 5 over 2, I get plus or minus 1 half, plus or minus 5 over 2. So those are the possible roots. So then what you do is you start plugging in. And I always start with 1, if, if it's usually going to be one of the roots, plus or minus 1. So I plug in 1 for x into my equation here, and I got 8. So 1 is not a root. So I plugged in negative 1. Negative 1 cubed times 2 is negative 2. Negative 1 squared uh, is positive 1, so I get minus 1, and then minus 2 from here, and then plus 5. Yeah, you add that up, you get 0. So x equal to negative 1 is a root. Okay? So, and then you can just keep plugging them in until you find all the ones that give you 0. All right? Well, there should be a little shortcut to this, and there is. If I had this, 15x cubed minus 32x squared plus 3x plus 2 equal to 0. And I want to find the rational roots. I take my p. It's 2, so it's plus or minus 1 and 2 are the factors. 15 plus or minus 15 plus or minus 5. And I take 1 for both of them. So I'm going to plug in 1 first, and I don't get 0. I plug in 2 into here, and I end up getting 0. You can plug it all in and figure it out. You end up getting 0 for p of 2. So that means that x equal 2 is a root. So instead of keep checking all of these possibilities, I'm now going to do synthetic division. To find the rest of the roots, I'm going to do synthetic division. I'm going to put my 2 out here, because x equals 2. And I'm going to take my coefficients, 15, negative 32, 3, and 2. And I'm going to do synthetic. Bring the 15 down, multiply, add them up, multiply, add them up, multiply, add them up. I get no remainders, because I know it works, because I already checked it here. Uh, you know, remainder theorem. I plugged in and got zero, so I know I'm not going to have a remainder. So x minus 2 is a factor, and then remember, constant x, x squared, so 15x squared minus 2x minus 1 is the other factor, 
I break that down by doing fabulous factoring. Factors of 15 that differ by 2 are 5 and 3. Uh, 3 minus 5 gives me the negative 2. I got to take my 15 and split it up as 3 and 5. Put the 3 into both of those. The 5 into both of those. I get x minus 2 times 5x plus 1 times 3x minus 1. And then I set them all equal to 0. I get x equal to 2, which I found already. x equal to negative 1 fifth, which would have been right there and x equal to one-third, which is right there. So it's got to be in here. It's just we don't know which one. Either you plug them all in and try to find which one's equal to zero, or you find one that's equal to zero, and then do synthetic, factor what's left over, and uh, set each of those factors equal to zero and solve it. Okay? Long problem? You betcha. Okay? We won't do enough of them, but we'll do enough that you can get a feel for it. Okay? What about irrational roots? Those are rational roots. What about irrational roots? Okay, remember those numbers that they don't work out evenly, like uh, the square root of 2, pi? Okay, well, they have conjugate roots. If an irrational or a complex number is a root, then its conjugate pair is also a root. Okay, remember, it's like plus or minus. So if the square root of 2 and 1 plus i are roots, then so is negative square root of 2 and 1 minus i. Remember we did the complex numbers and we talked about complex conjugates. You just change the sign in between in front of the, the uh, complex part. Okay, So those are conjugate pairs. So then uh, the roots here would be x minus the square root of 2, x plus. And, and the thing to remember here is when we plug it back in we change the sign, right? Well here we, we do minus minus because then when you distribute that minus then it changes it back. It's kind of complicated but it's always x minus x minus when you put your um, complexes in there, okay? Your imaginary numbers. The last thing in here is Descartes' rule of signs, okay? We've talked about um, finding rational roots, irrational roots, and now how can you figure out how many roots you would have? Well, that's what Descartes did here. He said if P of X is a polynomial with real coefficients, and you want to know how many positive roots you have in that polynomial, it's equal to the number of sign changes for that function when you have x in there or less by uh, an even number. So it could be 4, 2, or 0, or 2, or 0, number of possible roots. If you, if you want to know how many negative roots, then you plug a negative x into your polynomial, and the number of negative roots would be uh, that many or an even number less than that. Okay. So for example, I know it sounds kind of confusing, let's look at an example here. Here my polynomial is x cubed minus x squared plus 1 equals 0. So how many positive roots do I have? Well, I look at my polynomial just the way it is, because uh, that's p of x. I go from a positive to a negative, so that's one sign change. I go from a negative to a positive, that's another sign change. That's what we meant by sign changes here. Okay. So uh, I, I have two sign changes, so that means I could have two, or I could be less an even number, less 2, okay, so I can get 0 or 2 positive roots. I don't know what they are, but I know I could have 2 or 0 positive roots. I won't just get one positive root. It's either going to be 0 or 2. How many negative roots? Well, now you plug in a negative x into here. So when you take a negative x cubed, you get a negative x cubed, because a negative times a negative is positive, times a negative is negative. So I got a negative x cubed, put a negative x in, uh, for x, that's squaring, it's just going to keep it the same sign, so it stays minus x squared plus my 1. Sign changes. Negative to a negative, that's not a sign change. Negative to a positive, that's one sign change. So I'll get one sign change. So that means I'll get one negative root. I'm not going to subtract 2 from it and say negative 1 root, because you're not going to have a negative number of roots. So I can have at most one negative root here, and either 2 or 1 two or none positive roots, okay? And I'm guessing that because that's an x cubed, I could get three roots and it could be two of those and one of those, but that's just something you get from experience. I'm not asking you to do all that. Just to be able to find the number of possible roots, not the actual roots, okay? We do that by this and the uh, irrational and rational root theorems, okay? A lot of, a lot of stuff in there. Um, We'll take it piece by piece in class and look at each of them individually. Uh, again, this is getting into some nitty-gritty algebra stuff here. Um, not a whole lot of fun.
because there's a, a lot to it, but we, you know, some things you just got to kind of grind through it. So that's what we'll do. All right, we'll get after it tomorrow in class. See you then. Bye.